Hey, welcome to the podcast. I am Joel here with my dad. Hey, welcome. We are glad you're here. It's always a joy to have you join us. Yes. So today, Dad, um, I was thinking about something. I've been writing about it, and I was reminded of a the first time I ever went to Africa. I went to this conference, and there was a guy there. He was a bishop, and uh, that was his you know official church title. And he got up and he started telling all of these African folks who were kind of poor. Um, about the importance of owning land and basically that if you spoke the words correctly, that this reality would manifest itself because that's what God wanted for you. And that was my first exposure to, I guess, what you would call the name it, claim it theology. Now, for a while, I was so opposed to that idea, but this is weird, but as I'm getting older, I'm thinking, actually, I think there's something to the power of your words I thought that'd be an interesting thing for us to talk about today because um, there's there's a lot in the Bible in, that involves like things speaking things as they, as they aren't as though they are. Oh yeah, and the elements of faith involved in speaking. So of course there's the extreme of it, right? The extreme uh, name it claim it people, um, and then but then there's the other people that don't that they just kind of ignore those verses. So where's the happy medium? Yeah, well, there's a tendency to any, we tend to overreact to anything, you know? Yeah. And so, um, because- You always talked about that pendulum. We swing from one side to yeah. the other. Yeah, yeah. We, we can't stay in the middle. We're always like way over here, like, yeah, it's all name it, claim it, or, oh, it's nothing like that. Yeah, the hard part is to find the middle ground. And then, so in reaction to the, you know, the importance of your words, you go, well, you know, that's all nonsense. So therefore you-, you that's not true. And there is some power in it. I mean, scripture talks about there's power in the words. And Life and death and the power of the tongue. Yeah, and the, the name it, claim it, the, the word of faith movement um, would not have lasted as long as it did. Uh, I guess still does to some degree if there were not a serious amount of truth in it. And so there is a amount of truth in it. Uh, life and death are in the power of the tongue, as you say. And, you know, and they even recognize that in psychology. You've heard of what they call the self-fulfilling prophecy. If you just keep saying, I'm a loser, I'm a loser, I'm a loser, guess what you're going to become? A oh, loser. But the psycho-cybernetics element of it, they say that basically you, you, we, well, okay, so here's where Jesus talks about this. I mean, he says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So right. as you're speaking these things, it's revealing what's in your heart. And what's in your heart is what you're focused on. And self-fulfilling prophecy you tend yeah. to get what you're focused on you tend to go if you're looking that for negative you're focus on yeah if you're looking for everything to be negative you're going to find it and seek and you shall find what you're looking for is what you're going to tend to find so if you're always looking for negative things you're going to tend to find negative things so there's a tremendous there is a tremendous power in it and you're uh you know this was even long before the word of faith movement with the uh power of positive thinking you know yeah, that was that's even right. i guess when i was younger even uh the power of positive what was thinking. that guy's name that wrote that book uh you'll find it in quick just a google second there uh, it was on my tongue until you asked me there, <laughs> thinking of him. But it, there is a power in thinking positively. There's a power in speaking positively. When you get to the extreme, what was his name? Norman Vincent Peale. Norman Vincent Peale. There yeah. you go. When you get to the extreme is when somehow you think you're creating your own reality. Because God through, and, and the truth of that is that God spoke things into existence. And so when you take that to an extreme, you go, well, we're in the image of God, so we can speak things into existence. Yeah. And to a degree, there is some truth to it, you know, in the, the self-fulfilling prophecy. But, you know, I had somebody ask me one time, um, if this Christian is praying for a job and this Christian is praying for a job, which Christian is going to get that job? Right. And I felt like the best answer was one that was probably the one that was related to the boss's sister, you know, would probably be the one to get the job because um, actually probably the one with the best resume right. who's praying for the job. In fact, he might even get it even if he wasn't praying for the job over the guy who's praying for the job because there are other forces at work too. So you can, you're not going to necessarily create your own reality by speaking it into existence, but you can impact how you view things through that. And so there is a balance between that. You're, you know, it's when we think somehow that we have this creative power and I'm going to create this world um, and make this happen, you know. And then the other thing is there's, you know, delight yourself in the Lord and he'll give you the desires of your heart. And so many people go, oh, well, I'm going to delight myself in the Lord and he's going to give me that nice car that I wanted or whatever, you know. And so I'm going to start claiming that. Well, then your delight's not really in the Lord. Yeah. It's really in the car. 
I, something Jordan Peterson talked about that was pretty, it's, it's a deep thought. I haven't been able to completely wrap my mind around it is the idea that when God spoke, the logos brought order to chaos. So there was already something there. Darkness was hovering over the face of the deep and God said, let there be. And that when he said, let there be, he was manifesting order out of chaos. Right. And he's basically saying that it's, it's our obligation as humans to speak as best as we can truth and as we speak truth as best as we know it it reveals itself more and we get in line with it which is a i mean yeah that's that's a real that is a real power of prayer is a, it's not to get god to line up with us and do what we want him to do it's to align ourselves with god yeah that's really what prayer is all about and of course you know from my understanding that chaos came about you know it's not like it was there all the time it eternally existed God, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the heavens and the earth became void and without form. Isn't that, um, I mean, some people say that that happened with the fall of Satan, right? right? When he, when his domain, yeah. C.S. Lewis kind of hints at that when he talks about, uh, is that in the Paralander series where he kind of hints at that when Satan yeah, fell, yeah. this entire third of the universe was thrown into chaos? The, dark, the silent planet, yeah. earth being the silent, out of the silent planet is the one where he talks about that. And then right in the middle of that, God chose to... Uh, well, C.S. Lewis can come up with some crazy stuff, but he gets away with it because he's C.S. Lewis, right? Well, and the other thing is whenever people <laughs> attack him theologically, he says, oh, it was just a story. That's right. That's, right. that's what he says, you know, about the But I mean, he basically Chronicles. hints at the idea that when Satan fell and all of his angels were cast down, it was this in this domain. And then God, when he decided to do his redemption story, decided to do it right in the middle of the chaos right. that had been created by fallen Satan. So it's, it's like a repeating redemptive story. I mean, that's a... a anyways but well, it, it starts comes out with, of the like what we call the gap theory that between yeah. one genesis 1 1 and 1 2 there was this time of chaos that was caused by and we assume it was the fall of satan we don't really know yeah but um and we could do a whole podcast just on that that would be fascinating yeah. yeah 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 but so, then so god what I'm, all i'm saying is when god created out of chaos that chaos he had also created the elements that made that chaos yeah right so which we can't like, we have no capacity to create elements but maybe we can right. re realign through looking for, I mean, there's lots of psychological theories of that. You find what you're looking for and you don't see what you're not looking for. Well, and that's, that's like what when Jesus you, said, seek and you shall find. Yeah. You find what you're looking for. It's like, I'm looking at, uh, Emily and I are looking to get a toy, a new Toyota, uh, not a new one, yeah. but a used one. And like, and I was like, Rav, I want the one of those RAV4s. I wonder if they make it in white. And all of a sudden, pop, They're I everywhere. see RAV4s yeah. in white everywhere and you've probably seen that little video where they have the people throwing the ball around you yes. how many times they pass yes. that basketball Selected, yeah. and the gorilla dances through or the teddy bear or whatever, the bear or whatever yeah but there's you're so focused on tracking the ball that you don't even see the gorilla you're watching the gorilla dance that's an interesting thing google that if you get a chance to get, if google uh is it, dancing gorilla yeah dancing that. gorilla if you google that it'll show you this Basketball. psychological test and it's pretty yeah, fast now we've told you look for oh, yeah, the, don't look, look for the gorilla don't look for the gorilla just follow look, the instructions there, yeah this is not the gorilla you're looking for so I want to talk about, again, we started kind of with that Proverbs 18, 21, life and death. Uh, the tongue has, a, well, the NIV says the tongue has the power of life and death and those who love it will eat its fruits. And something that you said to, I don't, I think it was actually in a sermon you did, maybe when we were a little kids, like, and you were the principal of our school or something, <laughs> you, you took, no, no, it was when you were, it was when you were a pastor. You took a picture of a little kid yeah, and you crumpled it up and then you like took it apart and you're like, oh, it's just words. And you were talking about the power of words right? and how you know, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Wrong. Wrong. Words yeah. hurt you a lot longer than sticks and stones. Which falls in line with the power of words. I mean, yeah. you can, if you say the right nasty thing to somebody, it can stick with them way longer than whacking them with a stick. Yeah. Oh, I can, I can remember sometimes even when my dad said things to me and I think of them even now, you know, and there's, I mean, there's no hurt and there's no pain I've gotten over that, but it was like, wow, that really, that impacted me at the moment. And there are things, and there's, I can't remember anything else happened that day or that year even probably. Yeah. And so, yeah, there are things that we say that, uh, that really leave a lasting wound or a lasting impact. And I think that's really what that scripture is talking about being life and death and the power of the tongue. It's more of, you know, yeah, it's self-talk what you're saying to yourself, but I believe the real power of it is in what we're saying to other people. And that's why Ephesians, it talks about let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying in other words, it's saying let let no speech that proceeds out of your mouth be bringing death, but mm -hmm. let it be that which builds up, which that which edifies. And it says, then that passage goes on to say, that you grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. So when we're sticking others with our words and saying things that tear down instead of build up, it actually grieves God. Mm. Wow, that's pretty powerful, isn't it? The, 
Okay, so this is where it gets tricky because sometimes I feel like I'm just speaking the truth of what's going on and people feel like it's hurting them. Yeah. Well. And we've gotten to this point in our society where words uh, words can be considered like, I mean, you can actually like, there's yeah. this thing, hate speech. Yeah. And they say, well, it's so it's all of a sudden it's determining the motives behind it where I'm saying, here's the reality of the situation. And somebody's saying, well, those words hurt me. Um, that's a tricky place to be in because it all depends on the hearer. Yeah, and and a lot of communication, if you're studying communication, what is said, there, in between what is said, okay, it starts in your brain, it comes out through your mouth, well, there's a filter there that you're probably not always able to express what you mean in your brain. Then there's noise, what they call it, in between the communication, which it may be literal and noise or it may just be, and then the person hears it and then their brain translates it. Right. And so you've got all these different areas here where what you say may not be, that may, may not even, I even say things, that's not even what I meant. That's that game we used to play as kids, uh, telephone, where you start one thing at one and then tra yeah. translate it to the next kid and the kid would whisper it and but whisper it. But that happens whisper. between one person to another too yeah. because it's got to go from my brain to your brain and between there, there's a lot of interaction. And not place. to mention the whole framework through which the person is listening has their upbringing of what those words meant in the past. Exactly, or, yeah. So you, you just, it's and, really amazing. What's that, um, the single greatest illusion in communication or the single greatest problem in communication is the illusion that it has taken place. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> It is. We, we just assume a person. And you know, the other thing is, if you look at a thesaurus, which is supposed to be filled with synonyms at the beginning of the thesaurus, you know, that's not a dinosaur. It will say there's really no such thing as a synonym. No two words mean the exact same thing. Yeah. They all carry inflections yeah, yeah. of meaning that mean something slightly different. And so, so when you use a word, it can mean something totally different to somebody else. So here's the challenge that I'm struggling with. I, this thing I'm th always thinking about is with the potential for miscommunication. Mm -hmm. I mean, you see this on Facebook. You put something innocuous on Facebook and mm -hmm. then people interpret it. And they're like, I can't believe you hate people like that. And you're like, mm -hmm. uh, with that problem, how do you keep from no corrupt communication proceeding from your mouth? Well, without it's not saying that it, they, it doesn't come into their head and get corrupt because to the pure, all things are pure, but to the, to the pro, uh, uh, reprobate, all things are reprobate, you know? Okay, so let's go with that one. So I'm pure, just all things are pure. If I'm I saying, really believe that what I'm saying is pure, uh -huh. then I have no responsibility. Um, I, That's where it's tricky, right? Yeah, yeah. But I would say, you know, here again, I'm gonna, I always play the Jesus card. Uh -huh. <laughs> but here we go again. He was supposedly the uh, epitome <laughs> of all we should be. So I guess you could play his card all okay, day I'm long. Okay, play yeah. the Jesus yeah. card again. I do believe he is the epitome of all. I said yeah. supposedly, but yes. Yeah. Yeah. The, the bottom line is when I stand before the Lord, can I stand before him with clean hands and a pure heart? So in other words, if in my heart, what I'm saying to you is sincerely pure, yeah, except your heart is deceitfully wicked. It is, it is. <laughs> but all I've got to go on is there, and I have to then trust that the Holy Spirit is going to reveal if there's something that's not as pure as I thought it was in there. So in some ways, you have to speak it and then be willing to rebuke. Be, you, don't to be to rebuke. Always, you don't always have to speak it. You know, there's mm. you can always just shut your mouth. In fact, I, I always, uh, I love the saying where it says, I never pass up a good chance to say nothing. You know, because... You very seldomly regret what you don't say. Right. There are times, you know, but very most of the time you regret saying it rather than not saying it. Except that I think we are living in a world where out of fear of being shamed or silenced, a lot yeah. of people aren't speaking up when they should speak up because they're going to get shamed or, uh, you know, the political correctness movement. Yeah. And that's a real challenge. So, again, that's that pendulum swing. You've got people that say say things and they just, you know, they just blast it like a shotgun at any, right. any time they got, they can pull the trigger as quickly as they can reload. They're bam, 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 bam. But then you lose, well, I think you lose any street cred, really, if you've got, if you're just always firing your gun. Yeah. It's when, when do you know when to fire? How do you know when to fire, I guess, is, or when you, wisdom is knowing when to fire, I guess, you're, off your yeah. words. Yeah, yeah, and knowing who to fire at, too. I mean, by fire at, I don't mean attacking yeah, somebody, but, but I mean, who's going to listen? That's what you Jesus know. talked about. I'm not going to throw pearls before swine. Exactly. If yeah. they're not going to listen, why are you wasting your breath to say that? And you were talking earlier about, like, uh, you know, kind of the snowflake thing. Oh, you hurt me. You wounded me. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Right. And so you will wound people sometimes and even when you're trying to help them. Yeah. Oh, you, you wounded me plenty growing up with your words. <laughs> oh, good. But they were, I but I don't look back at them and go, 
because you didn't do it from a place of anger. And I think that's where the key is. Like even yeah. when you would discipline me and you would have to say, Joel, this is wrong about you. And that is, the, I think that is a challenging thing is sometimes we have to tell somebody they're wrong about something. But then when you are on the shaky ground of, well, what's right, what's wrong? They might say, well, how do you know? Yeah. Um, and again, it comes back to what is this? Is just true, right, just, pure, you know, the things that Jesus would have walked out. It, it gets really tricky. Well, and that is the wonderful, really wonderful thing about having the scripture because it does give us an anchor. And that's why it's so important that we know the scripture because it is the one unchanging. Right. And so therefore you can look at something in society and you say, well, society now says this is right. Is that right? Is it wrong? Well, you know, scripture may not address it, in which case I don't, you know, it, I, it, if it doesn't address it, it isn't really a moral issue. Right. You know, um, but on the moral issues that are unchanging, God's very clear about the things we need to know. And therefore I can say, you know, I can love you. I can do this, but that is incorrect behavior. That yeah. is not proper behavior. And whether you accept that or not, whether you, because you may be a floating cloud and you may have no anchor in scripture, but I have no responsibility to try and tie that cloud down. Yeah. You'll give account to God for yourself. Well, and, and that's that's another key element of when the when it's time to use the power of your words is first of all is the person ready, and then second of all, I think we live in a society too where uh, the truth bomb is what we call it. Drop the mic, say yeah. what you say your piece, and walk now off. I'm done. Yeah, throwing the grenade, and you got to deal with the truth as it is. And the the reality is, and you see this in, in at home too with people like they're just like, well, it's time that the truth comes out. And so a father just blasts his son or his daughter or his spouse or you know the, the reverse can happen yeah. and you go yeah but the, that's also not godly like the, the real key is, is using minimum necessary force what's the minimum force of your words that's necessary to accomplish this purpose again it may be to speak softly and carry a big stick but uh because um uh, another thing jordan peterson says is that you know you may have blown somebody away and you may have won the war the war of words and but people who have been beaten in a war don't like to hang out with the people that beat them yeah. so you actually lose in the end you may have spoken your piece but then you're wondering well why is this relationship in such bad shape well because you used a truth bomb when all you really needed was just a little truth because you won yeah you, you won, won. Yeah. yeah and now you're victorious and alone yeah <laughs> there's a little poem that says a man convinced against his will is a man that is to be convinced still yeah and so when you you twist somebody and tighten them in the corner and they finally have just have to admit, well, typically they won't. I mean, you know, they'll admit that they'll say that grass is red before they'll say it's green. If you if that's what you're saying, you know, and they'll just walk away, yeah. even though they know they're wrong. That's just kind of the, who we are. When you're pinned in a corner, you'll defend it to the end. Yeah. But that's where like scripture talks about a gentle answer turns down, uh, uh, turns away wrath, but harsh words stir up anger. And so all these things, if you're really trying to communicate, it's not going to be heard for your volume. Yeah. You know, um, you know, like even at yelling at kids, they, it's not the volume that causes them to respond. It's that they know the next step is you're going to take action. Right, right. And here we are back to parenting as well. Um, and, but, in the, but in the same way with people too, you know, you're, you're yelling, you're, the, the, the louder you yell, the less you're really heard. That's true. Well, and so back to that power of parenting thing too. The power of words in parenting, better said, is as a parent, you have to remember you have a very unique. You are like a godlike figure to your kid. And when you, I saw somebody at Chick Fil A the other day, and yeah. I, was, I almost lashed. She was telling her kid, her own kid, "You're so stupid. What makes you think?" Jeez. And I was about to yeah. say, I was about to tell that lady, just because you feel like you're a piece of junk doesn't mean you have to communicate that to your kid. Yeah. Um, but I mean, those kind of words, when a godlike figure says those kind of things, that's the stuff that sticks with you forever. And I mean, for kids, they don't know anything different than their parents. And that's, what's just tragic. When I see parents, they get frustrated or they just feel horribly about themselves. And usually it's a reflection on like that without lady, I could pretty much tell by the way she was dressed and such. Uh, yes, I was judging, um, <laughs> that she did not feel good about herself. Yeah. And so she was spitting that onto her kids, calling them stupid and those are, that makes me so furious because those are the words that stick with you forever. Yeah. And they determine, in many ways, they determine your destiny unless, what do they say, it takes 10 affirmations to to overcome any negative statement that's ever been said you know, to you? The, the really sad part, though, is that she was probably reflecting what she was told when she was a I kid. I know, it's and true. And so it goes back, you know, it just passes on from generation to generation. That's true. And, uh, 
you know, the Lord can break that and he can begin to build within you who you are in him. And um, Ruby, Ruby what, Payne talks about that in the power. And when she talks about the in poverty, that she talks about that one of the quick, the things they use is their words to, do, to establish dominance hierarchies. Right, yeah. So the first thing you do is you, if you're intimidated by somebody, you insult them quickly to establish that you're quicker than them verbally. And that's why verbal prowess and in insults is really so powerful in poverty. And uh, she just says, it's just part of the, uh, the survival instinct. Yeah, it and is. if you don't move past that, you're going to pass it on to your kids. Um, yeah. And, and for people who aren't that way, you think that they're not being sincere. Right. When you're in that poverty. Yeah. Mentality. Like, oh, you're just, she, oh, he's just sucking up. Yeah. No, he's just, this is passing on a compliment. He's just being a kind person. Or yeah. You know, you, you don't understand that kindness because you see that as a weakness if you're in that situation, because you're always on the defense. Mm. You're always feeling like somebody's out to take advantage of you. And so therefore you have to keep your guards up. And as you say, you have to make the first strike. Right. And it comes across in rejection too. You know, well, if somebody, if you sense somebody rejecting you, well, who needs them anyway? You know, and yes. so you reject them first. Which is interesting can... because a lot of the comedy we see on TV is that quick witted, uh, like I was watching yeah. the um, kind of Bob Newhart type stuff from the, what was that? The, when, did, when was Newhart out? Was that like the eighties? And long time ago, just the difference <laughs> in humor there um, yeah. between humor now is, is just watching people just insult yeah. each other on TV. And we pick that up. Um, go back to like Andy Griffith show, you know, mm -hmm. those are hilarious. Different are kind of humor, so yeah. Much, but it's a totally different, it's not an insulting, it's not a belittling kind of a humor. And, and that's all we have because that's easy to do. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. and again, this may be a very controversial thing to say, but they statistically, they show that it, the lower your income level, the more TV you watch. So right. a function of poverty would be more TV. So that's who they target the comment, the humor after is that vulgar kind of crass, insulting humor. And, um, yeah, it's, it's kind of a self-perpetuating cycle because if that's the world you live in and that's what you think is funny, yeah, then that's what you're going to be listening to. Which is really one of the sad things about that too is in the, in the old days when there was the Ozzy and the Harriet and the Father Knows Best and the Leave It to Beaver. I mean, okay, so it was maybe a little cheesy, maybe a lot cheesy. Yeah. But the fact is if you were in a very dysfunctional family, you could at least see a a model of a family that didn't operate that way. Mm, what, and I mean, your family wasn't the optimal all the time, right? No, we were, yeah. we were pretty much a, you know, kind of hollered out kind of a deal, you know? Yeah. And, um, that's all we really knew. And, um, so when I, you know, met your mom and they they were just like totally opposite of that, you know, it was really hard for me to adjust to that. Yeah. We, I remember we talked about that yeah. in that podcast a couple of weeks ago where you, where you, with you and mom. Yeah. It um, was very difficult. So, how did you overcome? So you grew up in that, where it's like kind of the verbal, like yeah. the sharper you were with your words, the more power it gave you. How did you overcome that, Jesus? <laughs> well, that was maybe a start. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. That but, is the answer again, but yes. Yeah, it was really being around people who didn't who who that didn't fly with. Mm. You know, if you come out with a sarcastic remark, people just sort of look at you. Yeah, and I think maybe it's some in the north too. You know, because I even when I okay, all you listeners who live north of mason dixie there uh, <laughs> we've alienated half the audience <laughs> yeah don't turn it off for a few minutes come back in in a couple of minutes when i first came down to the south you know uh your mom met your mom she was talking we talked about this too how she was saying oh those yankees they're just this and that you know i thought i ah, get out of here you know that's that's but first time i went home for a visit after being away for maybe a year year and a half or something went because Boy, these people are in your face, rude, man. Aggressive, you know? huh? Just aggressive, yeah. And so I realized that some of it, I think, does have to do, but like sarcasm, for example, you know, she would tell me like, well, that's just not, you know, that's not godly, you know, it was kind of your mom's approach to sarcasm. And I thought- Well, it is, it is a, we, we in psychology, we, we say it's a, sarcasm is anger's and, ugly cousin or something like and, that, yeah. Yeah, it's anger. And, and I thought, well, that, no, that's just, you know, that's cool, that's sharp, you know. And, and now I see these shirts around, you know, sarcasm, that's one of my superpowers, you know, and stuff like that, you know. And everybody think, man, you know, it really isn't very godly. Mm. And that's, you know, uh, the Bible talks about let your yay be yay, your no be no, speak, again, no corrupt communication. And it's, it's not godly to, because it's sarcasm, it's power is that it tears others down. Right. Well, and it's sarcasm is also, I think of it as safe, um, safe, the safe okay. way to insult someone. Oh, yeah, yeah I'm just joking. Just Can you take kidding. a joke? Yeah, it's like yeah. a safe, ins safe insult. Yeah. yeah. And when I first heard that, you know, oh, there's a truth, there's an element of truth whenever you say those things, ah, oh, it's not really, I'm just making fun of it. But later I've realized 
it really doesn't help it. It doesn't build up. And that's what it says. Don't let corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. But, which means instead of that, let it be words that edify, which simply means to build up. And so you're not going to find any sarcasm that builds up. So even if you just shut your mouth, you're not doing what that scripture says, because it says instead of sarcasm and criticism and tearing down, words that build up, edify. According to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. That's interesting. Yeah. That's a, we've referenced that a bunch. So it's Ephesians 4.29, if you want to look it up, by the way. Yeah. It's um, in there. Yeah. And um, so it's, it's a powerful, it's a good passage to memorize. In fact, it's one I've had, I've brought back to the front of my memory file mm-hmm. because it's so hard these days to keep your mouth shut and not be critical when you're watching the news or when you're listening to mm-hmm. what's going on in, in the political realm or in the, I mean, anything it, it, there's because the world is, we are so divided now and everybody else is an idiot. You know, it's not like they have a different opinion than me. They're just total idiots. Well, and you know? I think another element of it is is the knowing when. So I am convinced that we've maybe gone a little too far about not speaking up. And when you don't speak up, yeah, the, the other side runs rampant, right? The things that the un, the un, things we would consider ungodly based on our biblical standards, those are going to run rampant if there's no other voice speaking for them, right? But then the other issue is if you're always just, I think the key is you've really got to think through what you're going to say. Right, because if you don't, you're just going to blend into the noise because everybody else is like, "Well, all these stupid people on the other side." Well, that doesn't get anywhere. Right. But if you come at it from a very unique angle, that's not the standard thing because you've really thought it through yourself. Think before you speak. I mean, that's a classic. Really think it through and say, "What's this going to be?" Then, first of all, it strengthens you, I think, because it it gives you better. I I just remember hearing um. This thing is Ravi Zacharias, and I watched somebody. I thought somebody had asked him a stump of a question. Like I thought he was done. Like they had stumped him. He came back with a response that was incredible. And then I heard it later. I think it was him. I think it was Ravi Zacharias interviewing him afterwards, and he's like, "I've been doing this for forty years." Yeah. He said, yeah. "And I've th- I've had to think through everything that I believe over and over and over again." And when you mention thinking it through, one of the things that we oftentimes don't do is think through how does their their position, which is a opposed to you makes sense to them yeah because obviously it does because your words are not going to convince them unless they've spoken in the terms that they understand right yeah because we just think well they're just an idiot they haven't thought about it at all no they've probably thought about it as much as you have they may just have a different usually it's a different premise right and you, mo- you may both on. be idiots right yeah <laughs> but if true. you're both two intelligent individuals yeah. they've probably thought through some really legit legitimate things yeah and your words are gonna have no power if you don't speak in terms of well Again, the, speak in terms of the other man's interest. What is it that there's that's so? What is it that the need that they're feeling, and then how are you speaking in terms of that interest? Because otherwise, you may just be talking. You may be talking up here. They're talking over here, and you're there's no connection point for anything you're even saying. And then at that point, your words lose all power because it's just noise. Yeah, and sometimes you are talking about totally different things, which happens a lot. A lot of times, you know, yeah. They'll be saying this. Somebody said this, and that was really totally idiotic. Because this is the truth. You go, well, you're not even on the same plane. You're, you're talking about totally different things. Right. And then again, because people are looking, and that's the other thing is people look for, people find what they're looking for. And if somebody's looking for something negative to pull out of anything you say, they're going to find something negative to yeah. pull out of anything you say. Yeah. So, so it's very important, important to understand the other person's perspective. Because again, here's the amazing thing. It, Proverbs says a couple of times, every man's way is right in his own nice. eyes. Yeah. So no matter how foolish their logic may appear to you, no matter how stupid the conclusion may be in your sight, in their mind, it makes total sense. Right. And so unless you understand how they understand that this makes sense, you're not going to be able to offer an alternative opinion. Yeah. So the first, when you, when you said think. what you're going to do is think it through, think not just what you think, well, this is my, man, I got my guns all loaded. Yeah, yeah but you got to figure out what is it they're thinking. The problem is, I think a lot of us is we feel like I've got to respond right now. And and I can't give them any points. Yeah, I can't, I can't give them any points. I can't say, well, that's, that's a good point. You know, that, that could really be true. I may not know about I may talk be wrong about, about and that. And talk about power of your words. Acknowledging the other person is right. So talk disarming. Get, oh, my goodness. That's huge. When somebody goes to me, oh, you've made a really good point. Have you thought about this, though, too? And then I'm like, exactly. dude, that guy just affirmed what I said. It's like, that's powerful words is, oh, yeah, you've got a good point. That's right. Yeah. And yeah. 
Exactly. That's powerful stuff right there. So yeah. there's power in our words. It's important that we speak, and I guess that Ephesians 4.29 would be the best passage for this whole thing. It's like letting no corrupt communication proceed out of our mouth, but don't stop there. Yeah. But make sure that what is coming out of your mouth is building the other person up, encouraging them, ministering grace to them, the King James says, and meeting their need and helping them out. And then people will listen to you if you if you're speaking, if you're encouraging them, you know it's the old how to win friends and influence yeah. people. A lot of it is listening first. Now, here's a problem though, Dad. If we actually followed that, the world would be really quiet. You know, <laughs> I, will, I will end with this story. I remember one time I was reading that passage where it says Jesus said, "I only say that which I hear the Father say. I only do that which I see the Father do." And I thought I was just sitting there and I was thinking, "Wow, Lord, if I only spoke what I heard the Father say, I wouldn't say much." And I felt like the Lord said. That's the idea. If you liked what you heard, please consider sharing this with a friend. For more information, visit joelmalm.com or rickmalm.com. Thanks for listening.